Spring is surely one of the most exciting times in the wildlife calendar. After a harsh winter, life is bursting forth and perhaps no animal better epitomises that than the Mad March Hare. It's a cold and crisp Shropshire dawn. and nature is slow to stir. The sun is held at bay, its warmth still a distant hope. But then, subtly, a change in the wind, a break in the clouds, and there is movement on the fields. The animals which have managed to survive the long and cold winter are eagerly awaiting the first signs of spring. The month of March is often thought of as the start of spring, and as these hares warm themselves up, they begin their March madness, for which they are famous. They will box and scratch each other during courtship, but hares are usually shy, enigmatic and nocturnal creatures, usually only venturing out under the cover of darkness to feed. So merely chasing each other around in the open and in broad daylight certainly may seem like real madness to many. Brown hares can be found in some numbers round here. However, in many parts of the country, they have been declining due to changing agricultural practices, such as more intensive land use and the loss and poor maintenance of hedgerows. In fact, they are now only second to the water vole as Britain's fastest declining mammal. All this activity has not gone unnoticed. There's a red fox and another one. A fox cannot match the speed and agility of a hare. The way foxes hunt depends more on ambush and surprise to press home a successful attack, and these hares know that. So on this broad expanse of field, they can more or less relax. The foxes will have to try somewhere else for their breakfast, Perhaps a field mouse might be easier to catch. Seeing predators and prey together like this is a treat worthy of any early morning film trip. But what can be done to preserve scenes such as these? Farmland like this used to be a haven for all wildlife, including hares. But with the modern intensification of farming, much of that wildlife disappeared. However, it doesn't have to be that way. A short distance away, Mark and Irene have built up a successful farm business, but they've also tried to make room for nature. Mark, what sort of things have you done to attract wildlife on your, on your land? Well, we're currently walking through a coppice which we planted four years ago. Um, there's a variety of trees in here, which luckily seem to be doing very well. And as you can see on the, uh, the floor, the vegetation is very different from what you would normally expect in a farming environment. So that has a beneficial effect for many wildlife you'd not normally see on a farm. This land has obviously been taken out of the production of your farm. So what effect has that had on profitability? Very little, I would think. I mean, if you were to look at it closely, it's probably had some impact on the, the final profit of the farm. but. Uh, it'll be a very small impact and we've done it because we want the wildlife on the farm so that has its own benefits and its own profit to us. Creating coppices is not the only measure they have taken to ensure their land is attractive to wildlife. Their philosophy stems from a deep love and respect for the natural world. Well we do think that the land is for people today but it's also for people tomorrow. Mark and I both share a, a passion for landscape and animals, but that always goes beyond just the production of food animals. Uh, we've both always loved wildlife, and we think that's an important kind of relationship to have those animals with the land as well. When it comes to preserving nature, Mark and Irene are happy to turn even the most simple farming practice on its head. 
Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, isn't this fence upside down? Shouldn't the big holes be at the top and the little ones at the bottom? Yes, you're right. exactly right, yes, but we did it for a reason. Right. The, uh, as we have mainly large animals, i.e. cattle on this farm, we needed a, a stock-proof fence to keep them out of the coppice, but we felt that uh, we needed to put the wire the other way up so it would allow things like hares or whatever other wild animals to get through, whereas the size of these holes here are probably too small to yeah. let them through easily, but it has no impact on the cattle because they can't get their head through any of the holes. Was that your own idea? Or? I think so. Nobody actually told us we should do it. It was just something we discussed and uh, certainly Irene felt that it would be better if it was put that way up and I couldn't see any problem with doing that. Upside down fences are just the beginning of Mark's plans. We're currently looking at doing a scrape in what is a low hole which is poorly drained at the moment. Um, that will provide a habitat for sort of wetland birds hopefully. We're close to a moss area which has got curlews and other waders that would hopefully come across here as well. So why do it? What do Mark and Irene get out of the creation of these features for the benefit of wild animals? We both like to just sometimes go out walking down the meadows to have a look what's there or isn't there. So it is important to, to both of us to, to have um, a life that is involved with a living land. Um, very much. Farming is sometimes given a bad name when it comes to conservation. But what I've seen here shows that with a little bit of planning and care, as well as a passion to preserve the natural world, agriculture and wildlife can thrive together. Mm -hmm.